Well, good morning, and this is the week after Easter, and we're going back to our series in the Psalms. And I want to tell you about one of the most profound Psalms in the Bible. Uh, it's kind of strange to be saying there's more important passages than others. I don't mean it that way. But this Psalm has some profound information in it. And it was given to King David, and David decided to write a psalm about it. And uh, so turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 1. And uh, we are going to be looking basically at the first verse. We will get to the rest of the psalm next week. So Psalm 110, and what is being said here is so profound that it's referenced many times in the New Testament. And I'll go through those passages as well, explaining the truth here. But Psalm 110 starts out this way. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, these words are so profound that if you just read it without thinking about it, you miss it. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, it says in the first five words, the Lord says to my Lord. There are three persons referenced there. The first person, the Lord, uh, that is the word Yahweh or perhaps Jehovah. We don't exactly know how it's pronounced. The Jewish people were so concerned about mispronouncing the Lord's name that uh, they just said the Tetragrammatron, or they substituted the word Adonai, because they didn't want to mispronounce the Lord's name. And uh, so this is a reference to the Father. So God the Father says, he's instructing, uh, giving something informational to my Lord, the my there is a reference to King David. And then King David is talking about a person who is his Lord. So it's the Lord, God the Father, says to my Lord, and the word there is Adonai. And so there are three people referenced here, uh, three persons, God the Father, King David, and the Messiah, my Lord. So uh, he is looking at this, David is, and he is seeing that there is a being that's going to be his son, but is going to be greater than him and be his Lord. And uh, so this is a very profound thing. In, in, incidentally, the words, the Lord says to my Lord, those five words are so profound. That's what it is in English, five words. In, in Hebrew... It's only three, because Hebrew has a way of attaching pronouns and articles to words. And so it's basically the Lord instructs to my Lord. And then to my Lord is one word. So there are three words. And that's all I've been working looking at is those three words. And at talking about this greater David, the Lord says to my Lord, the Lord there at the end, is the greater David. He's from David, but he's greater than David. So we'll just call him the greater David, or I may say the Messiah or Christ. And he instructs him, sit at my right hand. So there is a person from David that's going to be sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Now, that means somehow that the one who sits at the right hand of God the Father has conquered sin that doesn't have a sin problem. And uh, so there he is. He's sitting at God's right hand, a man, but who is at, in the order of God in that he can sit in the same throne as God, right next to him. And then God the Father says, until I, God the Father says, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So now, 
uh, God the Father is saying, I'm going to serve you, uh, the Lord who is at his right hand, and I'm going to do all these things for you because you deserve it. So uh, this is a very deserving person who has evidently conquered sin, conquered death, and has the privilege of sitting at the right hand of the Father. So uh, this is going to be, this is a profound passage, a profound statement, and David saw it prophetically and gave it to us from that standpoint. Now the truth of this intriguing statement is referenced many times. It's referenced by Jesus Christ. It's referenced uh, by Peter on the day of Pentecost. It's referenced by Paul. Is referenced by the writer of Hebrews. And uh, this truth is used in many different applications. Now the first application I want to look at has to do with Jesus before the Pharisees. Turn in your Bibles. Uh, we, this is the last we're going to come to this passage. But remember it says, The Lord said to my Lord, uh, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies uh, your footstool. And that's all it is. You have to remember that. Now we're going to look at the implications. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. Now here's the situation. There were two groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees were people who did not believe in the resurrection of Christ. A resurrection. There is no resurrection from the dead, they said. And uh, so uh, they came to Jesus and they said, uh, hey, there was a man that married a woman and then he died childless. So his brother married his wife so that he could raise a child in his brother's name. And he died until there were five brothers that married this woman and they all died. Now in the resurrection, <laughs> whose wife is he? And Jesus said, uh, to them, you err, you do err in not knowing the scriptures. Uh, first of all, in heaven, they neither give or take in marriage. But uh, tell me this, did not God say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And when he said that, it was to Moses. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died. And he said, now, you tell me. Is God the God of the dead, or God is the God of the living? And it was profound to them, because they had never seen that passage that way. Of course, they must be resurrected from the dead, or there must be life on the other side, because God wouldn't be the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And uh, so the Pharisees were saying, All right, yeah, you really set those Sadducees on their backside, uh, because there is a resurrection from the dead. But then shortly after that, then Jesus puts the Pharisees into a situation where they believe in the resurrection, but they don't want to believe in the Messiah being God. And uh, so he says this to them in Matthew chapter 22, and starting with verse uh, 41. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, The son of David, which means of the order of David. He's from David. He said to them, Then how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. So Jesus used this passage right here in Psalm 110. And he was trying to help them understand that just designating the Messiah as the son of David didn't cut it. He was the son of David, but he was more than that. He was someone who was David's Lord. Now, how could that be? And the they didn't want to go to the implications of what that meant, because earlier, and I could find this for you in uh, John chapter uh, 10, 
they were going to stone Jesus, these same Pharisees. Maybe not identically the same Pharisees, but a group of Pharisees. And Jesus said, for what good work from the Father are you going to stone me? And they said, we're not going to stone you for any good work, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself out to be God. And then Jesus said, well, you know, these people uh, that are judges are called like gods. And uh, then how can, if they can be called gods, how are you going to say that the one whom the Lord has sent would not be called the son of God? And they didn't know what to say with that. They didn't want to imply it. They wanted to stone him because he had implied that God was his father and therefore that he was the son of God. And uh, that would have answered the question. You see, he is man, but he is son of man son of David, but also son of God. But they didn't want to go there. So uh, Jesus used this passage and the implications of it and how profound it was. Now, if you reel forward, maybe, oh, maybe a year later, he is standing before Caiaphas. And Caiaphas is getting frustrated because uh, Jesus isn't answering any questions. It's an illegal trial. It's no sunshine. It's in the middle of the night. There aren't witnesses uh, from the crowds of people, but they do have false witnesses there, and they're not telling the truth. And uh, so he, he gets frustrated with Jesus because he doesn't say anything. And finally, he just asks him straight out. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 26, and verse 63, but Jesus kept silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell me, tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God, of the order of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now he doesn't say hereafter you will see the Son of God. He says you will see the Son of Man uh, sitting at the right hand of power. And that sitting at the right hand of power is a reference to the truth that's in Psalm 110 verse 1. And then coming in the clouds is a reference to a passage in Daniel where the Messiah is coming back to the earth. And, and instead of saying, oh, I never had seen those passages like that before. You're right. The, this, there is a man who goes up into heaven who's coming back, and he's coming in power. And there's that passage in Psalm 110 that talks about a man sitting ahead at the right hand of the Father who is also David's superior, but born from David. And I never really saw all the implications of this. And you're right. But instead he says, no, you're wrong. You are a false leader. You are a false teacher. Verse 65, then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spat on his face, beat him with his, their fists, and others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? So we see that first Jesus talks to the Pharisees, and he says, Whose son is the Messiah? And then why does David call him my Lord? And then before Caiaphas, he makes a reference to that Psalm 110 passage. And uh, then, uh, after that, we have a statement made by Peter. Now, Jesus has died on the cross. He's raised from heaven, raised from the grave. He ascended into heaven some uh, 30, 40 days later. And then on the day of Pentecost, which is 50 days, the uh, 50th day after uh a Sunday near Passover, that's why it's called Penta 50, uh, there is this rushing mighty wind that comes and distributes the 
Spirit of God upon the apostles, and they prophesy, uh, and as uh, they speak in languages, and these people from all over the world that have come there for Pentecost, and probably Easter and Pentecost, they hear all these languages praising God, and they're wondering what in the world is happening. And Peter gets up, and he is beginning to tell them what uh, this is all about. And I'm looking at Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 2, verse 22. He says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourself know, this man, <clears throat> now you know Jesus walked on the water, he raised the dead, <coughs> he healed the lepers, he, he did all these marvelous miracles, the feeding of the 5,000, all those, and people are saying, <coughs> could this be the son of David? Could this be the Messiah? This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, because this was determined before the world was created. <laughs> and uh, in, in the Garden of Eden, it was promised that there would be a child come from you, Eve, that would have his heel bruised, but he would crush the serpent's head, and he would reverse all of these curses. <coughs> And then there is the uh, promise in Isaiah 53 about how he was wounded for our transgressions. Uh, Psalm 22, he was pierced and uh, the gambled for his clothing. And all these things, predetermined plan, the foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men, the Romans, and put him to death. But God raised him up again putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in his power. Death could not keep a grip on him. He broke it. For David says, of him. So here's another psalm that David wrote about uh, Jesus. I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at the right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue exulted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brethren, even back then they were brethren, brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, who wrote that quote, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, on God's throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that is, he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer to clay. So he was talking about the resurrection of Christ. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we all are witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, hmm, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear, for it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he who himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So that was the closing argument of uh, Peter's Pentecost sermon. And then he gives the invitation. He says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. Lord and Christ. Now, see, the Messiah was supposed to come from David, the Christ, but he's also to be Lord, exactly what that passage in Psalm 110 said. And this Jesus, 
whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? And Peter said, Repent, change your mind. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, he, the passage was used to talk to the Pharisees. The passage was used in front of Caiaphas. The passage was used in front of the Jews on the day of Pentecost and its implications and its truth. And then to the church, Paul uses it. Uh, you turn in your Bibles to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18. And Paul is trying to help the church realize the blessings that they have in Jesus Christ. And uh, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. He says, I, I hope that you, I pray that you're going to be able to understand how great a blessing you have in Jesus Christ and what it is that our hope is. Now that isn't, oh, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. No, it's, it's, this is your certitude and this is what you can expect. This is your hope. And uh, so it says, what is the hope of his calling? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And, uh, of course, you don't get an inheritance until somebody dies. Who died? Jesus Christ. And uh, somebody raised from the dead. And so there's an inheritance that spills over to us. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ, whom he raised from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Now that's a reference to Psalm 110, isn't it? Seated at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet. There's another reference to Psalm 110, verse 1, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So you see, there are many applications to the truth that's stated in Psalm 110. Not only that David said, my son is going to be my Lord. And uh, then uh, before Caiaphas, the implication of it, and he couldn't stand that. And rather than accept it, he said that Jesus was wrong and had him crucified. And Peter preached it on the day of Pentecost and said, you know what that means, don't you? That means that you killed the Messiah. But that was God's plan. He's now sitting at the right hand of the Father, and this Holy Spirit that you see indicates to us that he actually has sat down. And then Paul says, look at the blessings you have. We have in Jesus Christ all authority and all a power and uh, because we are co with him, the bride of Christ, we have all of these wonderful things incurring in to us. But it doesn't stop there. The writer of Hebrews, we don't know for certitude who the writer of Hebrews is, but turn in your Bibles to Hebrews. And I'm looking at chapter 1 and the first three verses here. It says here, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways. God, God spoke in, to people in many, many ways. He even used a donkey, a talking donkey, to tell Balaam to straighten up. But uh, then he, he gave the Ten Commandments in, on a piece of stone. Sometimes he'd dictate things. Sometimes... Uh, he would uh, speak in a burning bush. But uh, there are many ways, and many ways in which he spoke. 
in these last days has spoken to us in his Son. Now that means the Son of God, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now that is a reference back to Psalm 110. When he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Now that's the preamble and that is what this book is going to prove. And then he sets out to show the greatness of uh, and the superiority of Jesus Christ. And if you go to verse 13 of this same chapter, But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? That's Psalm 110. And he's using the truth of it to show that this man from David, who is called by David his Lord, is going to be sitting at the right hand of the Father. That's not anything that an angel can do. And, you know, angels are more powerful than men. But here is a man that's going to be exalted above the angels and sit at the right hand of the Father. And uh, so that that's incredible. And it says here in, in a statement right after that in verse 14, And they are they not, that is angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? And so he's putting the angels in his place, and by doing that he also is showing where the Son of Man and the Son of God, the same person, will be seated at the right hand of the Father. Well, he develops this uh, theme and goes forward about eight chapters into the book. And he has something to say in Psalm, not Psalm, Hebrews 8 and verse 1. It says, now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. <clears throat> now, uh, that means that he's talking about, once again, that Psalm chapter 10, 110 and verse 1, that there is a person who's going to be seated at the right hand of the Father, and uh, then it adds in a little bit extra thing about being a minister and uh, going to be a high priest. And wouldn't you know that in the same psalm, Psalm 110 and verse 7, it talks about that this, this Lord, David's Lord, will also be after the order of Melchizedek. And so that's the second part next week of this sermon, and I will develop that. But uh, this is an incredible, incredible statement that's made in Psalm 110. And so many times we just read the Psalms and we just read them and they just hurry through them. And we don't let the truth of it percolate down upon us. The Pharisees missed it. The Sadducees missed it. Caiaphas missed it. Thank God there were some people on the day of Pentecost that understood it. Uh, uh, Paul is telling us the implications of it. There are eight chapters and more in the book of Hebrews that are trying to explain the implications of Psalm 110 and verse 1. So this is incredible. And uh, the uh, sitting at the right hand of the Father. Uh, how do we know that that happened? We can't see it, can we? It did, we didn't see it with our eyes. How do we know that it happened? Well, there is a, a statement made by Jesus that helps us understand that. And uh, it's found in uh, John, John chapter 14. John 14 and verse 16. This is in the upper room, 
And uh, he tells them in, earlier in chapter 14, uh, I'm going to be leaving you, and you, can, you can't follow me at the time. And, and uh, well, and you know the way. And they said, well, how do we know the way? And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But I'm going to be leaving you, but I'm not going to leave you orphans. And in verse 16, it says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. And then if you go later on that night, and we, he says in John 16 and verse 7, these words, 16 verse 7, but I tell you the truth, it is your, to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send, it, send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me, and concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. So he goes to the Father. He sits down at the right hand of the Father. And he asks the Father, can we send the Holy Spirit? And the Father says, yes. And of course, you heard by Peter's mouth that he says, and what you see today is an indication that he has sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So the day of Pentecost is our proof that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father. So uh, this is a profound passage, and it's only three words in the Hebrew. And yet it states that Jesus means basically that Jesus is the son of David and the son of God, and that he sits down at the right hand of the Father, and the Father is going to put everyone under Jesus' feet, and that he has conquered death, the enemies of death and Satan, and sin.